Sure. Um, so a while back this year, I implemented a ray tracing renderer in uh, sort of OCaml uh, in software uh, that renders toruses. Um, and for the hacking day, I was curious about OCaml 5 multi-core and a renderer, uh, specifically a ray tracing renderer, is uh, a very good uh, guinea pig to test it on. Um, just how a, a ray tracer works, um, we have our pixel grid and for each pixel we kind of shoot out a ray um, and analytically intersects that with our uh, scene. The scene is defined by a series of mathematical objects. Here's a sphere, um, but in my case, I did toruses, which are slightly more complex. Um, and there's a GIF here that shows that for each pixel, the computer just scans through left to right, top to bottom, like we're reading the words on a page um, and computes the color for each pixel. Now, the great thing about this, uh, about ray tracing, is that every single pixel is computed completely independently. Uh, the scene is immutable. Um, pixels don't interact with each other. And so this is an example of what's called an embarrassingly parallel uh, problem. And I have a little demonstration of the uh, sequential how do I do this? Let's see if this works. Is it going? Yes, potentially. Does it get maximized? I think you need to work. What do I need to do? Um, Share your screen. I'm already sharing it. Um, but does it like blow up big? No. Nope. No. Okay, cool. Um, hopefully you can see it big. Um, but if we show here, we see that basically we're scanning down uh, left to right, but it's very quick. So you can't see the left to right scanning, but you can see it going from top to bottom. Um, and we have two interlocked tori. And this is the sequential version, just to show it, and then stop the demonstration. Does it go back to you? Yep. Okay, so we want to parallelize this. The issue with parallelization um, is that we want to block up our massive monolithic workload into chunks of smaller workloads, little tasks that each thread can work on independently. Um, and rendering is quite nice um, because there's a kind of, you, could, you can imagine it quite um, clearly in that we can either split it up by rows, we can split the workload up by columns, um, if we want to, we can even split it up by tiles, have uh, sort of square or rectangular tiles on the screen um, where each thread is working on a, a tile individually. And uh, I can then demonstrate again. This is going to be a bit painful. Uh, some examples of that tiling. So I'll show first rows, then columns, and then a nice little tiled example. Oh, that's a bit better. So first we have rows going top to bottom. Uh, we've chunked it up by uh, into eight sort of uh, big rows uh, that each go down one by one. We can do it by columns. We're going left to right. And then we can even do it by tiles as well. And we have a nice little, I made it randomized tiles because it looks cooler. 
And so those strategies, uh, my plan for this talk was to basically look at those strategies and then talk about uh, these strategies are you have to take into account cash performance and this is really important. Um, and then I did some experiments and it turns out for this case, it really doesn't matter at all. Um, no matter which way you split it up, it's kind of the same. Uh, so we have a graph here and we're showing the execution time um, on the Y axis and on the X axis, we have the number of work items per sort of chunk. And so on the far left side, we have one chunk. This is no parallelization whatsoever. You can see it flying off uh, into the vertical distance. As we add more chunks, suddenly multiple threads can start working simultaneously and the execution time starts falling. Uh, the machine I'm running on has four physical cores and as we start going towards four uh, tasks. We're starting to flatten out into a plateau, into a performance plateau. And this is a logarithmic graph as we're going further and further, uh, adding more and more sort of individual tasks. Basically, we're going, getting no performance gain whatsoever. As we get into sort of tens of thousands of uh, items, uh, oh, I got that wrong, sorry. Um, this is the number of work groups, not the number of items per group. Um, so this would be like the individual number of threads that we, uh, the number of, uh, yeah, I think I made that clear, potentially. Um, as we go to the right of the graph, um, we're starting to see the overhead of the scheduling system uh, become significant, um, where the amount of work per task is small enough that we do the work and then that scheduling overhead is sort of taking over and we see it creeping upwards. But it's interesting to note that um, in the documentation of Domains Lib, um, they sort of talk about the, the dangers of how inefficient the scheduling system is. But this is really forgiving. Um, you know, we have several orders of magnitude where we're explicitly setting the, the, the task size and it's basically the same performance. Um, it's only when we're getting to, you know, tens and tens of thousands um, of tasks that it starts creeping up and it's just creeping up. Um, it's not sort of exploded. Um, and so that's, that's quite nice. And, but setting the task size explicitly is a bit of a pain. We don't really want to do that. Um, but in domains lib, there exists a really nice function called parallel for. What this does is it takes a kind of a for loop. We basically have a for loop going over all the pixels. So that's a good start. And for each iteration of the sort of uh, parallel loop, we give it a function that takes the index and uh, executes the function. And parallel four does this work distribution for us. And critically, um, what it does is it computes uh, what, it consider, what it considers to be the optimal chunk size uh, to break the work up into. And it is by this equation, uh, the number of work items divided by eight times the number of domains. Um, for the purposes of this talk, domains are basically uh, the number of uh, cores you have. So I set it to four. Um, what you consider work items is, is quite important. I considered each work item to be one pixel. Um, this gives a task size of about 76,800. You could also consider each row to be a single work item. Um, this would divide that number by 1920. Um, and so we'd sort of be placed on a different uh, bit of the graph. 
So we can compare what domains lib, uh, sorry, we can compare what parallel four chooses compared to uh, the tiled example we had before. And so considering each pixel as a, uh, as a separate work item, uh, the black line is where parallel four chooses to place it. And we have some tests of the execution time. We can see that if we explicitly set uh, the chunking size, we get a slightly lower uh, execution time. And that's quite interesting. Um, and that is specifically due to the way that Parallel 4 distributes uh, the work. Uh, the way that I did it was in an iterative manner. Basically, you set a chunk size, and then you just chop up iteratively the workload. Um, that is efficient, it's linear time, um, but you need to take into account some edge cases when your chunk size doesn't exactly define, it doesn't exactly divide the size of the entire task, the, the whole program. Um, and so it's a little bit difficult. It's also not very functional. The way that domains lib does it is by in a divide and conquer manner, splitting the work up into two. Uh, if the size of the task that we've created is not is greater than the chunk size, divide into again. And this is a lot cleaner, like a lot nicer to work with, more functional. But we have a logarithmic overhead in the number of work items, which we see reflected in a slight overhead in the graph. Um, so the conclusions to come to, um, it's a little bit of a messy talk. There's not a huge number of conclusions to make. Um, but what we can say is that if you want to set the task size yourself, domains lib is very forgiving. Um, but you should probably just let it uh, run by itself. Um, you don't have to explicitly write out a load of complex um, scheduling stuff. Um, Parallel 4 actually provides you with a, an optional parameter called chunk size, which lets you um, put it in yourself instead of uh, it using the equation to work it out. Um, as well as this, I didn't go into it, but it was incredibly easy to convert my sequential code into parallel code. Um, it just worked uh, once I did it. Um, and even using the more explicit API outside of Parallel 4 just worked as well. Um, can't, we can't forget, however, that this workload is embarrassingly parallel. There's no interaction between pixels. Other workloads are sort of slightly less cooperative. Uh, and that's it from me.